Hey guys, this is Holland Chambers Biology coming to you with a lecture on the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, which is the ability to not evolve. Now, keep in mind, Hardy and Weinberg both derived this statistical formula independently. So two different people came up with the same theory at the same time, which means that it's definitely proven um, and what it states is that a population will not change over generations to come. So it's going to stay exactly the same. However, that's extremely hard to do. Um, the five principles that we're going to be talking about today is no natural selection, random mating, no mutations, large population, and no migration. So in order for no evolution to happen, you must hit all five of these factors. Now, Hardy-Weinberg, I know it looks way super confusing, but this will all kind of wash out um, in, in the end. Like, it's really, really easy. The first thing I want to point out is the formula P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared equals 1. Now, what this represents is P squared represents the homozygous dominant alleles within that population. 2PQ represents the heterozygous alleles in that population, and Q squared represents the recessive alleles in that population. Therefore, one represents 100% of the population, okay? So in order for no evolution to occur, genetic allele frequencies must stay the same throughout the generations. Now, Khan Academy um, does a really good job explaining all of this as well, if you want a little bit more. But I'm going to walk you guys through how this whole thing works um, at the very end. So let's go in and talk about um, what exactly Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium is. Amoeba Sisters does a great job, um, again, in order for no evolution to happen. You must hit all five of these factors. No natural selection, no mutation, no migration, large population, and random mating. If only one is disturbed, as in they decide they hit everything else except for a few of them decide to leave, then we're going to start looking at changes and changes drive evolution. Okay, so no natural selection means that the best suited or the fittest um, are going to survive is no longer applied, okay? So the environment cannot change. Keep in mind, natural selection is that the organisms are best suited for that specific environment. So if the environment doesn't change, why would the organisms change, okay? Classic example of this is in, in the deep ocean. So the ocean is still blue, still really dark, still cold, um, still salty. And so the organisms have had that environment for millions of years and they've never had to be forced to change. Now, number two is random mating. Now, random mating means that you're going to randomly mate with whoever is around and it doesn't matter their traits. Now, what this is the opposite of is sexual selection, okay? So sexual selection means that females will usually pick over-exaggerated traits of a male, and then those traits are what gets led into the next generation of children to come, and thus females drive evolution. So a classic example is the peacock. Here you've got the brown peacock is the female. Um, she will actually mate with the blue peacock, which is the, um, the male. The ones with the biggest feathers, which by the way, guys, you don't want to be a peacock with really big feathers because you're going to get stuck in the trees. Um, animals are going to find you. You're going to get eaten. Um, however, the ladies really like the big feathers because that means because you're not dead yet, you must be fast, strong, and cunning. And that's what they want to give to their kids. Okay, so number three is no mutations, no mutations of any kind. So you cannot change genetically whatsoever. So no point mutations, no frame shift, no crossing over in the chromosomes, no chromosomal abnormalities. Um, and for any reason, if there 
is a mutation within the population. Somehow, some way, that child is getting killed or eaten or somehow destroyed um, to not pass on that mutation. Um, classic example of no mutations is the coelacanth. Um, it is a fish that's been around for 400 million years and um, it's not evolved. So we still have the same coelacanth as a 400 million year old fossil and you can still find a living one today in South Africa. Now, number four, in order for Hardy Weinberg to not evolve, okay, so in order for the Hardy Weinberg principle to happen, you must have a large population. So this was a classic example of the passenger pigeon, which was in like billions, like their population was billions and billions of birds. Um, with a population that big and random mating, you are pretty much guaranteed not to mate with a family member. But if the population becomes too small, all of a sudden you have inbreeding happening and within inbreeding, you get recessive alleles that start to pop up in the family and now you have children with say six fingers or you have albinoism. So six fingers in the Amish community, um, albinism um, is predominant in a lot of Native American communities because of the inbreeding, the close relative um, connections that are starting to pop up, those recessive alleles. Now, number five is no migration. Now, remember, if you leave your environment and you need to adapt to those new environmental surroundings, a lot of times you cannot change, so therefore you die. And those that were a little bit better suited for that environment survive and pass on their alleles, okay? So in order for no evolution to happen, you cannot leave your habitat. And there's a couple of things I wanna talk about here. Number one is human impact, okay? So human impact is actually known as a bottleneck effect. So if you have, for example, this guy over here is stepping on um, certain bugs, let's say he doesn't really like the green ones, all of a sudden your genetic frequencies in your allele population start to shift from the original. And because of human impact, that is going to drive an evolutionary change, aka a shift in allele frequencies. Now, if you say have um, the founder effect, founder effect means that there's a big hurricane. We um, happen to swoop up, um, you know, say a bunch of iguanas and they landed out on the, say, Galapagos Islands. And whatever iguanas landed out there, those are the ones that would then mate, pass on their alleles, and eventually through thousands of years, that genetic frequency, because it's slightly different from the mainland, would start to change. And that's where you end up getting the mainland iguanas versus the Galapagos um, iguanas. Now, here's an example of another species who has not changed for millions of years. So remember, the coelacanth was one of them. The horseshoe crab is another one. So this guy has not changed for over 300 million years. Um, again, the environment's still the same. The ocean's the ocean. Um, they reproduce like crazy. We're talking like 88,000 eggs a year. Um, it's, you know, really adaptable because of its hard shell, it blends in. Um, you know, there's so many things that allows for it to not to evolve. Now to the contrary, the leatherback sea turtle here um, has evolved from the one of the largest fossils of sea turtles that we know, which is Archelon. Archelon um, was giant. And so throughout time, Archelon has slowly evolved into what we see today over here as a leatherback sea turtle. Okay, and again, those were three mutations. So let's go ahead and talk about, real quickly, the Hardy-Weinberg principle. So again, let's go and look at these allele frequencies, um, and I'm gonna show you guys how to solve that. So let's say, for example, you guys are messing with unicorns. So I've got blue unicorns, which is dominant, versus rainbow unicorns, which is recessive. Blue unicorns, I counted, a specific number of blue unicorns in the population, divided it by the total, and I got a percentage of 30%. Now, because blue is dominant, blue can either be homozygous dominant or heterozygous dominant, okay? Rainbow unicorns, just keeping this simple, guys, 
is recessive. And so I found through my calculations that 70% of the population was recessive. So what are the Hardy-Weinberg frequencies? First thing I need for you guys to do is to find your Q. So Q represents Q squared. Now Q squared, if you guys go back, right here is your pure recessive allele. So we can't find any of this other stuff because we don't know what P or Q is if it's a heterozygous combination. So recessive is the easiest one to work with. And with Hardy-Weinberg, that's the one that we're gonna start. So do not try to shortcut this, okay? Again, do not try to shortcut. Find Q first. Q is 70%. Remember, he's the recessive. You're gonna square root Q square, square root 70, which would be 0.7. And then Q by himself would be 0.83. So the reason why we square root is because it's Q squared. So I wanna get Q by himself, square root. Okay, so square root 0 0.70, and you guys end up getting Q by himself, which is 0 0.83. Well, the other formula is P plus Q equals 1. So therefore, you plug that in, 1 minus 0 0.83, and P is now 0.17. Q represents our recessive little b allele. P represents our dominant b allele. So if I want to find out how many unicorns are actually heterozygous blue, I simply go back and plug it into the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Knowing that P squared is homozygous dominant, 2PQ is our heterozygous, and Q squared is your recessive alleles, if I want to know how many are blue heterozygous, I simply use the 2PQ. So 2 times P, which was our big B, 0.17, Q is our 0.83, which represented our little allele, equals 0.28, and then of course to get that a percentage, just move the decimal over twice, and you now know that you have 28% of the unicorns are heterozygous. Now, if I wanna find out what are the other allele frequencies in this population, you just do the same thing. So little b, little b is Q squared in our formula. Plug in your Q, 0.83, square it, and that leads you back to 70%. Big B, big B is represented by P squared. So P you found was 0.17, square that which is 0.02 or 2% of the purebred population is going to be blue unicorns. Now, here's the deal. Generation 1 is 28%, 70%, 2%. So if you guys start to statistically analyze all these generations, and we end up at generation 50, and the same exact, oh, sorry, there's a typo there. So 28%, 70%, and then 2%, if these are exactly the same as the original population, then the species is not evolving. If, for any reason, this start, starts to shift, then the population is evolving, okay? So it cannot shift. So for unicorns not to evolve, that means that they met all five of the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium principles, okay? They didn't leave, they didn't migrate, um, there's, they're not born with any genetic anomalies, they're randomly mating, they're not doing some type of sexual selection, there's a billion unicorns, um, you know, so all of this is appearing, and therefore the rainbow and the blue stays consistent. Again, if any of this is broken, then the blue, because of a mutation, might end up being a pink unicorn, and suddenly you get sexual selection and a shift in the species. Okay. So please let me know if you have any questions. Again, you can email me on School Loop, um, direct message me on Instagram for more information about Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium and um, how it works. Feel free to watch Bozeman Science and Amoeba Sisters. Otherwise, um, stay tuned for more awesome lectures. Um, this is Holland Chambers Biology, checking out.